Next, from Springfield, we talked to Phil Gannett, president of the Illinois Coal Association, about how the election of Donald Trump will affect America's, as well as Illinois' coal industry. This runs about 20 minutes. Phil Gannett, thanks for joining us again on the Illinois Channel. And this is the first time we've had a chance to talk to you following the election of Donald Trump. Uh, what does his election portend for the Coal Association of the United States, let's say, or the coal industry, I should say, of the United States, and for Illinois uh, coal miners and businesses? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it means a lot. Uh, it changes everything. It's a total game changer. Uh, Hillary Clinton would have continued the policies of the Obama administration, which we called the war on coal. Uh, we expect a President Trump will withdraw those rules, the executive orders, and that's the interesting thing. For eight years, we complained that the president was going around Congress and enacting laws through executive orders and rulemakings. Well, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. And so those rulemakings are easy to withdraw. So we expect the Clean Power Plan to be gone, stream protection rule, Paris uh, Climate Treaty, everything's gone. And what impact, for people who don't know, they hear about regulations, it's rather obscure, I think, to a lot of people to really understand how that impacts the, the guy who's running a coal business or the guy who's a coal miner. What, what are some of the, you just mentioned them, but specifically what were they doing that were having such a negative impact on the ability to mine and sell coal? Yeah, it's, it was a two-pronged approach. One was to make it more difficult for coal-burning power plants to continue to operate. So it made it harder you had less of a market in the United States to sell coal. Then the stream protection rule was a, is a total rewrite, and that's flown completely under the radar because you, it doesn't get the attention that the Clean Power Plan does. But the stream protection rule is a total rewrite of the federal mining regulations that the Office of Surface Mining, that's in charge of this, took six years in secret to develop. They issued the rule, proposed rule, last July 2015, gave us 60 days to examine 6,000 pieces of paper and exhibits, and they wanted to rush this thing through. Furthermore, they didn't consult with the states. In Illinois, every coal mining state except Tennessee has an agency that is delegated the responsibility to administer the federal act. And the federal law requires the Office of Surface Mining, OSM, to consult with those states. They failed to do that. So we've been trying to hold that rule up for as long as we could. It was sent to the Office of Management and Budget, Office of the President, in May for a final review. Generally, those reviews are 30 to 45 days. The coal industry has sought meetings with OMB to, to show where the weaknesses, either procedurally or technically, that were in this rule to slow it down, and the rule still hasn't been issued. We expected them to issue it the end of September. Now, even if they do issue it, we don't care because we think President Trump will, will withdraw the rule. So that would have made it harder for us to get a coal permit. So it was a two-pronged approach. The one rule that has already gone into effect and then was later invalidated by the Supreme Court was the Mercury and Air Toxic Substance Act, MATS, MATS is the acronym. We've lost in this country 100,000 megawatts of base load coal-fired generation because those power plants could not or, would, or were not willing to make the financial investment to meet the stricter air quality standards. Now remember, the United States, even before Matt, the MATS rule, again, it's a rule, had the most strict emissions regulations of any country in the world. In fact, one of the st uh, statistics I like to use is in the last 40 years, the electricity generated from coal has doubled and the air emissions have been reduced by 80 percent. And so what the government was getting at was marginally, you know, uh, you know, more strict standards, but it really didn't have that much of an impact on the emissions because we're already very low. When you say the amount of electricity produced by coal doubled uh, in the United States? Right. From 1970 to probably... You know, 2015, 2014. Now, that's a, it's a surprising number because people would have thought the opposite, that the use of coal would have been declining over the years to produce electricity. Right, and it has. Uh, since 2008, I think uh, that was the last time coal had uh, uh, was more than 50 percent 
of the energy source for this country. And we've declined uh, pretty steadily since uh, 2008. Some of it's been because of these uh, policies by the Obama administration, and some of them, quite frankly, have been caused by uh, the uh, fracking, producing more natural gas, and the low price of natural gas. So those are the two factors that have impacted the coal business. You know, one we can fix a little bit, but natural gas is still going to be out there as a competitor, uh, and so that's going to be a concern. I can imagine a lot of uh, people who are concerned about the environment or would label themselves as environmentalists uh, would be saying, oh, my gosh, uh, here we go. We're going to be rolling the clock back. We're going to be making the air dirtier, uh, increasing the number of asthma cases around the country. What do you say to those people who have those concerns? We have the most strict air emissions uh, laws uh, in the world right now in, in the United States. The incremental gain by fewer emissions, we believe, is not worth the cost of, of doing that. And, and so, frankly, it's, it's, it's investing too much to get too little. And then when you look at the clean power plan, what everyone seems to forget is carbon dioxide is not a harmful gas like sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, mercury, and those three, are all, we're already controlling for that. If you have to operate in the United States, a power plant, coal-burning power plant right now, your emissions of those three uh, uh, gases are controlled that up to 98 percent of that gas is taken out of the, of the uh, 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 stream of gases that come out for the stack. So we're already controlling for that now. This whole notion that carbon dioxide is a harmful gas is crazy. You know, in sixth grade biology, I learned photosynthesis. You know, plants are good because they inhale carbon dioxide and exhale oxygen so we can live. And this whole notion of global warming, climate change is now taken on as a health issue. And, and I think people are, I think, wrongly too concerned about the impacts of that. And I'm, I, I, frankly, kind of tired of every unusual weather event right now is blamed on global warming. And the Earth has been here hundreds of millions of years. And you can't take an isolated event and blame it on global warming. And there's a lot of evidence out there. And I, I know you, we don't want to go down this path that we're going on, so I'll end it there. But Let, uh, let me jump in and say, if uh, the President Trump were to eliminate these uh, executive orders that the Obama administration had put into effect that had such a negative impact on the coal, associate, uh, coal industry. What, what economic impact might that have uh, on the miners that you represent, on the industry that you represent, and conceivably of uh, perhaps employment in Illinois? Uh, it's, it stops the bleeding, frankly. And like I mentioned, we're not going to get back to the billion tons of coal a year that uh, was produced in this country uh, as, uh, as recently as four years ago. Uh, this year we're That's a national figure. National right? figure, right. Uh, and this year we'll probably be around 700 million tons of coal. So that's been a decline of 30 percent that's pretty much occurred in the last four or five years. Let me, when we lost that coal, uh, as an energy source, what replaced it? Natural gas. And actually, the energy efficiency programs that are in place in a lot of states, including Illinois, have frankly worked. Uh, our demand for energy in Illinois has declined about 4 percent in the last couple of years. So for years and years, we saw the growth in energy uh, needs, you know, go up and up and up, and that's leveled off and, in fact, going down. So, so that's, you know, that's impacted it. And there's been a growth in renewables. And, frankly, we're all in favor of an all-of-the-above strategy for producing power in this country, but you've got to realize that you need baseload power. And, and we've and, talked and, about and, you know, that remind us again what base load means. Yeah, base load is is uh, is a source that can operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and up to 365 days a year. And uh, windmills don't produce power when the wind's not blowing, and solar panels don't make energy when the sun's not shining. And so they are not base load power units. They're good for peaking. They're good for when they're running, but they can't bring the reliability to the grid that people in the United States have, have come to, 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 to need.
So maybe technological breakthroughs might come down the road that they could be uh, producing base load power. Right now, they can't, those alternative energies. The other factor we often don't discuss with these wind and solar, uh, when people are pushing those as a uh, energy source, is the cost differential between electricity produced by wind and solar versus coal. Uh, as I understand it, what is coal, about $0.04 cents per kilowatt hour? Cents and, and, and what is the comparative cost? Uh, wind is about 20 to $0.22 cents per, megawatt, uh, per, per kilowatt hour. So uh, the only way that wind can compete in the marketplace right now is because of subsidies that they get from the federal government. Is, the is, is similar with solar uh, yes. being that high? Yeah. All, all the renewables, in order for them to be competitive as, a, as an energy source, they, they receive tax credits or tax breaks or subsidized in some way. I just saw an article, Lakeland uh, uh, Junior College uh, is taking apart their two uh, uh, windmills because it's going to cost $150,000 for them to repair, and they don't have the money to do that. Uh, and in the article, it noticed that it, it said that uh, in order to install them, it was free because they got federal government funding. Well, that's not free. <laughs> that, that came from your tax money and, and my tax money. But that's the notion out there is that, oh, yeah, I can put up a windmill and the government's going to pay me to install it, and then they're going to give me a subsidy, and then they're going to require people to buy it when it's, when it's available. Well, that's, that's a pretty good deal if you can get it. And that's, and that's what the renewable energy uh, folks have these days, and, and maybe some of that's going to change too. We're not saying do away with renewable energy. We're for all energy sources. And I think there's going to be a day, and it's not going to be next year, but we're going to be able to make base load power, you know, f something different. Not nuclear, not natural, no, and not using fossil fuels. So, you know, look at the technological advances that have been made during our lifetime. We're going to be able to make electricity by something else, maybe 50 years from now. We won't use coal, but we're not there yet. Yeah, right. And and so what you're saying is while we have those techno other alternative technologies being developed. And you have to do something before you can improve it, as I right. uh, often point out to people. So uh, that may, as you say, come. Uh, right now, of the electricity produced in the United States, or if you want to address Illinois, how much of it is that, you know, we take it for granted because we've, in our lifetime, always had electricity be abundant and affordable. How much of that electricity that's generated comes from coal? In the United States right now, it's about 30 percent. It, it varies because, the, and, and, and it's been trading places with natural gas. So they're pretty much neck and neck at around 30 percent. And, and, and each month, you know, it, there'll be uh, uh, slight changes. So 30, 60 uh, percent roughly from fossil fuels. From fossil fuels. Nuclear is running about 18 to 20 percent. So the, the remainder is renewables. Uh, so that Some is hydro. Right? Yeah, and, and that's, that's a renewable energy source too. About I think five or six percent is, is hydro. Uh, uh, but I think uh, all renewables across the country are probably running about eight percent so I didn't keep a running tab in my head here but that might be close to a hundred percent. And what is the cost differential between natural gas and coal? Are they comparable? We didn't mention the or, or, or are we having a danger of having electricity spike as we move from coal to natural gas? Yeah. Uh, as long as it's fracking uh, I think natural gas prices will be low. Again, it's a function of the supply and also the uh, uh, need for that. Uh, I might as well get to stop this right. You can edit it somewhere. Uh, and uh, so it's 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 according to you know what the, the supply is out there. If fracking is banned in certain states and and they can't access the that that natural gas, that may have an impact. We look at at uh, the the cost on the uh, the cents per million BTU, that's usually how we term this. Coal can compete at about three and a half to four dollars per million BTU. Natural gas prices today are about two dollars and eighty cents, so it's a little bit below coal. Uh, and I think going f for the future, you know, if if I'm if I own a power plant company and I want to continue to use fossil fuels, I'd likely go to natural gas because uh, it, un unless something happens to the fracking industry, uh, it, I think natural gas prices are going to be 
about where the coal is, and, and you don't know where federal policy is going to be. Maybe Trump's only in for four years. We get someone else to come in, and they're going to restore what Obama did. Uh, but I would make the bet on natural gas. Now, my members don't want to hear that because we think we can compete. But uh, and there's other issues with natural gas as well. Pipelines. I mean, you have to have a pipeline to get from the main trunk to your unit, and if you have to go through someone's property, there's issues of, of, of getting, you know, citing that pipeline. Look at all of the, you know, turmoil we have in this country on, on oil and gas pipelines right now. So that's the challenge that natural gas has, and that's what I think will keep coal in the mix because of the challenges that they have. But the prices are pretty close. And not to go too long, let me just uh, we'll wrap it up a couple. As far as then, would we say as far as jobs and the industry of the your members of the Illinois Coal Association, it, it's not to say that uh, getting rid of these uh, Obama restrictions is going to increase necessarily employment or the mining of coal, but at least it will allow those businesses that are operating to continue to operate, to afford to operate, right. those plants that are burning coal to continue to burn coal instead of shutting those down. How much of the coal that's mined in Illinois, um, and, and people I think don't understand how much coal we have in Illinois. We have a massive amount, right? There's something like the Saudi Arabia of coal. And Kuwait combined. Is there? Yeah. How how much of what we mine is for domestic use, whether domestic in Illinois or the United States, versus how much do we export, send down the Mississippi River to the Port of New Orleans and export to the world? Right. Uh, because our coal is high in sulfur, uh, power plants need to have pollution control equipment. That's called a scrubber. Uh, in the United States, a lot of plants did not immediately put on scrubbers in 1990 when they had to control for sulfur dioxide emissions. So our industry suffered some losses because, you, uh, because of that. Uh, we went from 60 million, 62 million tons produced in 1990, and I use that as the benchmark. Is that 62 in Illinois? Six, uh, in, yeah, I'm sorry, in, in Illinois, 62 million in Illinois with 10,000 workers. We declined steadily to 2003. And we, in 2003, we did 31 million tons. So our production got cut in half. Worse, the uh, workforce went from 10,000 to 3,500. We lost two-thirds of the jobs. We stayed in the low 30 million tons a year until about 2011, and then it started to spike up because the demand started to increase. Power plants out east started to put on scrubbers. And so for a long time, beginning in 2003, about 85% of our coal that we produced went out of state. So we have a, a way to get it out. Our coal fields are close to the Ohio and Mississippi rivers, so we can go anywhere in the world. In 2013, we ec of, of the amount of coal we produced that year, which is about 52 million tons, 12 million of that went to foreign countries, mostly to Europe. That market has dried up. Again, it's supply and demand. It's a marketplace. As the dollar grew stronger in value, it hurts exports. And so the coal that we were sending to England has been replaced by coal from Russia. And so we peaked again at 58 million tons in 2014. But our workforce was only 4,500. And that's because the productivity gains in the equipment were so great that we could mine almost as much as what we mined in 1990 with half the workforce. Since January 1, 2015, we've lost about 18, uh, 1,600 jobs, and that was because of the downturn. You know, the, the, the export market, the foreign market has dried up, power plants closed, and so that caused a little constriction in our, uh, uh, in, in our market. Uh, and w this year, we're about 25 percent down from last year. I project that we're going to do about 42 million tons this year. Last year, we did 56 million tons. I think we have a chance to grow because the two advantages we have in Illinois are our coal is, is our coal is easy to extract. We have huge seams, six or seven feet, easy to get the coal out, and we have four long wall mines that are the most productive. They just cut you know a path of coal, the surface will uh, subside, but that, that's accommodated for in the permit. So we have the most productive coal mines in the country and we have a way to get it to the market. And we know that way because we've been using it for a long time. And I think in a shrinking market, the low-cost producer is going to prevail, and that's what we have here in Illinois. So even if we shrink even a little more, as long as we can compete and get our product to the end users, which we can, I think we're going to be fine. 
or at least stabilize. We're not going to go back to 10,000 jobs. Uh, in fact, as of the end of September, we had 3,200. We dipped below 3,000 uh, in June 30th, but we gained a couple hundred jobs since then. And then lastly, uh, we have some some of your members, like Peabody Coal, I suspect, as a member, uh, had to uh, declare bankruptcy recently. Uh, is this going to have any impact? Is the Trump presidency going to have any impact on someone like them and, and you know, their ability to maintain operations? Well, I think just the, the uh, elimination of uh, the Obama policies are going to help Peabody. They're going to help every coal company. Uh, I don't think, you know, the, the bankruptcy courts function – uh, on their own. They're, they're not going to be impacted on, on who's president. Uh, Arch also filed for bankruptcy and they've emerged. They've, they've reorganized and, and they're out of bankruptcy now and I think the same is going to be for Peabody pretty soon. They, they incurred some, some debt uh, when, uh, when they probably shouldn't and they kind of guessed wrong in, in the market and you know when they made the decisions they seemed good and then the, 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 then the market turned and, and I think but I think both of them are going to e emerge from, you know, from that uh, as, as strong viable companies. All right. Well, Phil Gannett, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with us. You're welcome.